Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 37 of Diabetics for Diabetics Radio. Today's episode is titled, If I Were Diagnosed Yesterday, What I Would Not Do, The Things I Would Have Avoided Immediately Post-Diagnosis from a Number of Different Inputs, Physically, Mentally, Emotionally. Uh, in an effort to put my body in the best position to heal, okay? Um, if we haven't met yet, my name's Bowie. I've had type 1 diabetes for over 22 years. I have gone to social media to share my journey in healing naturally, all of the things that I've learned along the way, um, and all of the hope and faith in the fact that this is something that can be managed, treated readily, uh, so much more than we're being led to believe is possible, um, and creating community around the idea that we, the people with diabetes, can come together to, to make some significant changes um, in the healthcare setting. So I'm glad you're here. And this was really spurred. I'm so grateful for my followers and my subscribers because um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of really important questions. And one came from um, the mother of a newly diagnosed child with type 1 diabetes. And they brought up the point, okay, well, hey, listen, if you were in our shoes, what would you do? And it got me thinking, okay, Bowie, let's go back to day one. If I knew then what I know now, what would I do differently? And what's what's funny, and we'll we'll move past this relatively quickly. But uh, the story that people are being told now, in terms of the outlook for their diabetes, the reason it's happened the way it has, and what they can expect from the disease, what you are hearing now from your endocrinologist, from your general practitioner, is about the exact same thing that I heard when I was diagnosed in 2001. And I have heard this from multiple, multiple sources. I go out of my way to ask people who are newly diagnosed what they're hearing. They're getting the same spiel, okay? And that's an issue. Mine was 22 years ago, and you're telling me there was no progress in those 22 years as to what our possibilities for healing are? Unacceptable. And so let's start to talk about what not to do. There will be an episode after this. Episode 38 will be dedicated to, after we've addressed the things we need to avoid, what are the things that we can implement? Um, because what I've found along the way is that when you're diagnosed, we're always so ready to do, do, do. Like, what do I need to do? What do I need to add? And for me, it was much more helpful to take things away first. What can we clear? What can we move out of the way to make space for more things, right? Um, so much of disease has to do with an, an overaccumulation of stuff, mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, so that's why I wanted to focus more on what not to do, how to get rid of stuff, how to like put ourselves in a good position so that when we do begin things and start to add things on, their maximum potential can be reached and they can, they can have a much more desired effect. If, if we were just taking something and sprinkling it over, you know, kind of our disease state and the things that started the, um, the disease loop that we are in. So we need to consider three areas. Um, I feel like most people go to the physical first and foremost. They think, okay, what foods do I need to eat? What supplements do I need to take? Um, and they kind of bypass the emotional and mental aspects of, you know, a diabetes diagnosis and how heavy and traumatic that can be. So we're going to touch on three parts of all of these. Um, if there's anything I've missed or something that you want to know more about, do not hesitate to leave a comment, ask for more there. You know, uh, that's, that's what this is all about. We want to make sure that I'm covering all the bases and making sure you have what you need to move forward comfortably, 
um, in managing either your condition or your child's condition. So first things first, right? And this kind of, this gets under my skin because I feel like a lot of people are missing the point in, in what's to be expected with a diabetes diagnosis. So I want to first point out that things are not normal, okay, after diabetes. And that's, that's okay. We need to kind of let go of the idea of, okay, what do I need to do to get myself back to the point where I can do what I was doing before and not have to worry about it? And that's just not the case because in all honesty, diabetes is an undeniable bodily statement. This is the disease state is your body saying, hey, listen, something is not right. What we were doing was not working. Okay. And, you know, the, the overwhelming aspects of the, of a diagnosis, a diabetes diagnosis can make people want to resort to the things that they had before the safety and the comfort of what was routine before. But you have to realize that all of that led you to the disease state. So we need to be able to let those things go. And I mentioned fast food, I mentioned physical inactivity and kind of this technology dependence and a disconnection from nature. Those are three very broad topics, but we'll talk more about each of those, <clears throat> each of those things and kind of realize and think about what we've come to accept as normal. So and all of this usually stems from our desire for ourselves or our loved ones to live a normal life, right? I got diagnosed when I was eight. The biggest concern I had was still being able to play little league baseball, right? And my parents, you know, my parents were like, okay, we got to make sure he's able to be able to do all the normal things, birthday parties, um, swimming, you know, all of the things that a kid is supposed to do, you know, do whatever it takes to get them to that point. And some of those things are okay. I, you know, nothing, nothing is completely off guard or, or off limits when it comes to diabetes, but you have to consider the implications of what we've considered normal in society for our health, um, for our, you know, our emotional balance and all those kinds of things. So what you want more than just your kid to, to, to fit in and be normal is for them to feel like they belong, for them to feel safe and for them to be loved as they are. And if it's you with the diagnosis, you, you want to belong, you want to feel safe and you want to be loved no matter what. Okay, so kind of keep that at the heart of what you're seeking in managing diabetes, right? Don't get lost in what you think normal is supposed to look like or what you've been conditioned to believe normal is supposed to be, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. What not to do physically. So I'm, a, I'm coming from this from a food standpoint to begin with. So with our current understanding of the importance of nutrition, nutrient deficiencies and mineral imbalances in the development of di diabetes, these are the foods that I am taking off the shopping list. Okay. And I've talked extensively on this podcast about the roles each of these things plays in the development of diabetes. Go back and watch episode one through probably 15 that will talk all about um, iron and its role in the inflammatory cascade, all of the processed oils and sugars and what have you. But um, bleached, enriched, or fortifo fortified flour, okay? And this comes in the shape of breads, commercial breads, doughs, pizzas, cookies, cakes, pastries, what have you. All of these flours have a mineral profile that is conducive to inflammation. So hydrogenated processed oils, canola, vegetable, peanut, soybean, again, so many of these are almost unavoidable in a lot of commercial products these days 
if it's coming in a box or if it's prepackaged during the freezer section, chances are it's got one of those oils in them. So these are things that we want to uh, avoid entirely if we can um, or, or significantly reduce. Same goes for added sugar and low quality artificial sweeteners. That kind of has a little bit more of a common sense aspect to it from, from a diabetes standpoint. Um, low grade mass produced meats. So talking about, and this has much less to do with, you know, oh, vegan, are you saying that vegan is good for diabetes? No, not at all. I'm talking about food quality, right? So low grade mass produced meats um, and all of the things that go into those animals before they are butchered, um, anything processed, boxed, preserved, anything with dyes, flow agents, gums, things that you do not know what they do in the food or why they're there probably isn't a good indication for putting them in your mouth. So uh, I mentioned before free iron playing a huge part in as a source and exacerbating existing mineral deficiencies uh, in the body and how that can really, really disrupt cell physiology and how our immune system treats our body. Okay. So free iron, I think is probably the, my enemy numero uno when it comes to regulating food, um, specifically reduced iron, fortified iron, not necessarily the um, naturally occurring iron, like in meats, like in leafy greens. Again, look at the, or listen to those earlier podcast episodes about um, iron and the, the significance of how it's sourced and what it's complemented with. But um, the, the fortified and rich flour has got to go. Processed oils, right? Whether it be Crisco, you know, pure vegetable oil, canola oil, peanut oil, soybean oil, all of those polyunsaturated fatty acids that are in a high heat, high oxygen environment, they are full of free radicals that are major catalysts for uh, inflammatory responses in the body. Added sugar, okay? And I'm not, I'm not gonna out and out label sugar as an enemy in diabetes. I really don't think sugar itself is as bad as people make it out to be. But when you are adding it in copious amounts and the fact that the products that they are adding sugar to are typically already messed with so much from an ingredient standpoint, it's really, really not good for you. Whether it be like kids treats, like Gushers, fruit roll-ups, all of those, you know, kind of sweetened breakfast cereal, oh, all of it, no, no good. Okay. No good. Every, usually everything in those products, um, even, you know, soups, peanut butters, they are all laden with all of these processed oils, added sugars and sweeteners. Um, this goes for artificial sweeteners as well. Splenda, aspartame, erythritol, uh, sucralose. It's, people are always like, oh, well, what, you know, what am I supposed to sweeten stuff with? What about stevia? I don't personally use stevia. The only natural sweeteners I use are honey and maple syrup. Those are my go-tos. Um, naturally occurring, they've got really good mineral profiles, quality, as close to nature as you can get from the sweetening standpoint. Um, and if you do, you know, if you are so inclined and you want to use something, just don't overdo it. And then from the meat standpoint, so commercially processed meats, um, it's so ironic, you know, we talk about the bad things that, you know, you shouldn't be eating, uh, GMO crops, the hydrogenated oils, you don't want antibacterials or growth hormones added to your food, because then that means that you're, you know, you know, it's going to mess you up. But then we go out and we buy animal products from animals that were fed all of all of those things, right? So it's, you know, there is just like one one layer of one layer separating us from all of these terrible things that we ourselves are told not to consume, but we're consuming what consumes them. So we're just getting them in secondhand. So cheap, really like 
mass produced meat, it's really, 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 really not great for you. And it's something that needs to be, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for grass fed. I'm always looking for, you know, local farms. If they have it, if you're someplace that you are fortunate enough to um, get your hands on those, those should be a priority over just like get as much meat as I can for the lowest price possible because um, it's not just meat that you're getting. You're getting a lot of all the, all the extra stuff that's kind of in those animals. Processed prepackaged foods, okay? TV dinners, frozen pizzas, lunch, you know, it's just the food, the food is so processed, so um, propped up with so much added stuff, okay? If you don't know what it is on the ingredient level or why it's there, don't eat it. Don't eat it. And you may, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Bowie, what am I supposed to eat? You really, you really have to get back to cooking your own food using whole foods. That's really the bet, my, my greatest answer. It is simple. It may not be easy for all of you, but you've got to get back in the kitchen and start preparing uh, your own food. And remember, I mentioned before, throughout all of this, <clears throat> just because it's normal doesn't mean it's good for you, right? So let's remember that it's not normal to have every single piece of food that you eat wrapped in plastic, coming from another country, you know, spending days in transit to the shelves in your supermarket. It's not normal for an ingredient list for very simple products like a granola bar to take up the entire backside of the wrapper. Why are there so many things in such simple foodstuffs? Not normal to eat meals that contain zero fresh ingredients, right? Just because it's green does not mean it's fresh. What else? is in the, the, the liquid that, you know, all of those, um, preserved vegetables are, are in, you know, it's like, you have to, you have to think what else. And then it's not normal to have no, no role in the preparation of your food. So many people outsource their food prep and it comes at the cost of quality and the, the food quality is what, in, you know, is what dictates your health. All right. So this is, this is the food perspective, right? From, okay, what I'm looking to take out of the pantry, what I'm looking to take off the shopping list. And we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about more good foods to add to the list in the next episode of the podcast. All right. Now, when it comes to physical activity and getting active, if you aren't already, with a diabetes diagnosis, there can be a lot of fear around hypoglycemia and, and putting you or your child in an unfamiliar physical activity um, because you don't know how they're going to handle it or they're, you know, they're fragile and they need to be kind of bubble wrapped. Um, physical activity is so incredibly important for your health as a diabetic from developing lean muscle mass to improving your metabolism and your body's ability to use energy, uh, decreasing fat mass and fighting against insulin resistance. There's a lot, there's just, there's too much good to go over from a physical activity standpoint, lift weights, jump around, run out, outside make it make make everything outside if you possibly can right um so don't let the fear of going low right keep you from getting and trying new physical activities out right um lean in with curiosity like lean into learning what it is that your body can do and how far it can go before you start to have to read the messages that your body is sending back to you whether that be you know oh i feel low and i'm getting shaky or i don't i really don't feel well i think my blood sugar is high i think i need to address that before i continue whatever activity it, it's on 
Do not discourage people or yourself from trying many different things. It doesn't matter how you move. It matters that you move. Okay, so don't let diabetes make you, frag make you feel fragile or like you can't do something. And then tying back into food, a lot of the times that fear of hypoglycemia translates into a hyperfixation on always having food and kind of tying physical activity with eating, right? So a lot of it comes from fear, right? Because a lot of the times in the endocrinologist's office, and uh, hypoglycemia or low blood sugars is treated like the worst thing in the world. And if your blood sugar goes low, you're going to die. And it is something that you need to be mindful of. But again, as long as you are prepared and you have a plan of action, live your life. Like, keep going. Do, do different things. So don't let the habitual fear-driven snacking... Um, alter what you think you can do because it can kind of wreck your relationship with food. And I, you know, there are plenty of brands of granola bars that I will never eat again because I'm just so sick of them. And it got to a point where you're not eating food. You're not even tasting it. It's just like, Oh, I got done with practice. And then you throw it back and it disappears before you knew, you know what happens to it. And it takes the focus away from the relationship with your body and what your body needs. So that's, that's some, that's a really, really important facet of having diabetes is listening to what your body needs and being able to supply it in the moment. If you are on the, the perpetual loop of, Oh, well I moved, I better eat something. Oh, I, I moved, I better eat. It's, you're kind of destroying that and kind of like drowning it out with just kind of arbitrary, arbitrary fear driven habits. Right. And then from a, a rest standpoint, if your digestive system is always working, it's never resting. That's never good. Right. Especially when we know the digestive system has such a critical role in diabetic health as you know, and possibly the development of diabetes in the first place. That being said, this is not me saying that, oh yeah, no, forget about food. You don't need to worry about lows. No, you always need to have either food directly on your person, or you need to have the ability to access it where you are. And you need to have a plan of action, someone you can rely on to get you that food in the event of an emergency. Okay, fair enough. Um, and your physical environment matters, right? Are you in a clean space? Are you in a safe space? Do not underestimate what a cluttered house, what a, uh, a tense uh, or conflict laden household can do for your nervous system. Um, clean food, clean clothes, being showered and bathed. It's gonna protect you from parasites, bacteria, and viruses, all of which have their own arguments for having a role in the development of diabetes as well. Um, get outside. Sunlight and fresh air are your best friends from a nervous system standpoint, as well as a vitamin and mineral standpoint and regulating your circadian rhythm, making sure that you're sleeping properly. Uh, water quality, sleep hygiene, all of these things matter, okay? So if it is disrupting your sleep, whether that be blue light in your room, um, it's got to go. So now let's talk about the emotional side of things. Okay. Um, there were, there are fewer slides for this, but that does not, that's not any indication that this is less important than the food stuff. Handling the emotional and the mental side of diabetes is equally important to the physical, uh, the physical side of food and resources that you're supplying your body. So being diseased and being told you have diabetes is not a fault of you, the person, right? When I was first diagnosed, it was like, oh my God, you know what? Something's wrong with me. My, there's something wrong with my genes you know, whatever, 
whatever it is you were told in your endocrinologist's office, your child or you believes that there may be something wrong with them, right? So we need to reconstruct that outlook on a disease state as something in which it's a conversation between you and your body. A disease is your body saying something is not right and I need your help. And then you, as someone with the disease, your job is to help. That's it. Pretty simple. Okay. So it's important. There is nothing wrong with you. You do not have diabetes like as something that's your fault. There's no one to blame. Having diabetes is not the end of your life. Okay. So make sure that you, if you're a caretaker or if you have it and you, you know, you have someone in your environment who is trying to paint diabetes as this terrible, long, arduous battle that you're just going to have to slog through each day with to get to the end up, cut them out, cut them out of your life. That is not helpful. It's not true. I am someone who has lived with this for over 22 years. I live a very fulfilled life. It doesn't have to be that way. Counter that point, talking about the, the anti-fragile aspect of getting getting your you or your kids out and doing doing different things. Don't wrap your kids in bubble wrap, right? Like we are resilient. We are a resilient being. Master the basics of you know, having that emergency sugar of knowing how to speak up if you need something and then go be a kid, go, go live, you know, have them educated, have yourself educated in making good decisions when it comes to food, when it comes to social situations, but don't over, don't, don't be the helicopter parent. Don't, you know, deprive yourself of all of, all of life's joy just in the, in the, um, in the name of health, because how unhealthy is it to do that? You know, so um, then having a disease does not make you and what you need to take care of yourself a burden to anyone. And this is something I deal with, dealt with a lot. Something I I felt like I needed to take care of. I wanted to make sure that I did a good job with it so that no one else had to do it for me because if someone else had to do it for me, that meant that I was inconveniencing them. That is not true. Do not make anyone with diabetes feel like what they need to do is an issue or an inconvenience to you. It's not, they have to take care of themselves. Take care of yourself. Let your child ask for help. It is not a burden. Right. And don't try and hide that you're diabetic at all. I have most of my life because my idea of being a good diabetic was that no one would know that I was diabetic. Right. Like, oh, I'm so good at this. I seem normal. I'm like, really not. Right. Bad news. Right. Because in the event of an emergency, nobody knows what's wrong. Nobody knows how to go about helping you. So um do not be shy in sharing your story do not be shy in doing what you need to do to take care of yourself not a burden not an issue you do what you need to do All right and then from the isolation standpoint i mentioned before that it can be very isolating and you feel you kind of feel the weight of the accountability and the responsibility of having to take care of yourself so um Having diabetes can breed hyper-independence where you aren't willing to accept help from others. Um, I was kind of the kid that suffered in silence. Um, if I was having an issue, I felt like it was mine and mine alone. Did not feel comfortable sharing it with anybody else. And so it was, it was my, my burden. It was my weight. And so when things went bad, it was my fault all the shame, all the guilt, it all, it all weighed down on me, right? So if you are a caretaker for someone with diabetes or you have diabetes yourself, do not shame yourself for learning the ropes of a very, very complex and multifaceted disease. Very few people understand just how deeply rooted diabetes is and the weight that it, it creates and, and the relationship 
how it changes your relationship with so many things in your life that a lot of people take for granted. Um, and in the stumbling and the fumbling and, and kind of floundering that may happen when you first get diagnosed, this can make you resent yourself because you can't figure out why you're not getting it or why you keep making similar mistakes over again. And let me tell you, I'm 20 plus years in still making very, very, you know, first grade, first grade mistakes. Um, because your body changes over time, your relationship to different things, the environment, all of the different variables going into the situation is going to give you different outputs and it can really, really weigh down on how you feel about yourself. Okay. Um, I'm someone that stuck with it and kind of always, you know, Rocky, you know, wasn't always a straight line up, but I worked my way up. Other people, you know, they they have it for five or six years and they just let their bodies completely disintegrate. And um, it stems from not being, not feeling worthy. Um, why bother? It's all going to end anyway. It can, it can not turn, it can turn very, very ugly, very quickly. And it's scary. It, it's scary, especially for those diagnosed early on in life. You know, you are new to life. All of this is brand new. And then all of a sudden you're, you're scared of doing very normal things like eating food, like going to friends' houses, like playing outside. And so you, the hypervigilance and the hyper-awareness can breed this, you know, this sympathetic overload of fight or flight because, you know, Oh my God, did I just give myself too much insulin? Oh my God, am I allowed to eat this and this? Or is it only this? And you get lost in the sauce. If your blood sugar goes too high, you're like, how serious is this? Are my feet going to fall off? Oh my God, my blood sugar's low. Press the panic button, everything, you know, it's, it can be so, so overwhelming, especially in a young body. It's so important that there is a support system in place and that very few things in the state of diabetes are so immediately emergent that if you don't take care of it, everything goes to, everything goes to shit. And so, um, obviously there is the caveat of an extreme low blood sugar, a loss of consciousness, something like that. That is obviously um, an exemption to the rule, but and, and, and even these things here aren't something that you can avoid. There's going to be some worry. There's going to be some panic and some scare, but in experiencing them and in, in experiencing them with a supportive team of people who are there to help you and support you, the edge starts to wear off and you start to be more confident in handling yourselves in these situations. And you start to realize that they aren't as weighted as you may think they are. And so this bleeds into the mental aspect of it. So how you or your child or who you're caring for can kind of start to look uh, and defend against some of the bad things that can happen in someone who is mismanaging their diabetes, right? And if you look in any Facebook group, um, young or old, it, it can be so depressing because some, a lot of people out there have become victims to the disease. And I would argue that our system, our medical system, our healthcare system is designed to breed victims because victims are reliant on those supplying them with things. Um, so do not become a victim. Maintain your sense of faith and hope in something better. You are not doomed to your genetic fate. If you check any of, you know, any of my previous work on the genetic background of diabetes, it is not, not nearly as compelling as it's made out to be. Um, you know, where's this cure? Where's the cure? You know, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that I, I got the same spiel 
that you got if you were diagnosed, you know, yesterday. We're all getting the same, oh, you know, oh, stem cells, oh, the cure is almost here. If you just spend your time waiting for the cure, you're going to spend the rest of your life waiting for a cure, right? So don't let any negativity around the possibility of the cure or the fact that you may have to have diabetes your whole life take away from your hope or your faith or your willingness to try more things to further your health, right? Do not let that negativity bleed into other aspects of your life, like your relationships, like your careers. I've seen it so many times where someone's lack of self worth and willingness to take care of themselves based on the negativity around, well, there's no cure for diabetes. What's the point? And it bleeds into their, their work, their schoolwork, their careers, you know, their relationship with their family and their loved ones. Uh, so it all starts with self love and commit and committing to self betterment. Um, so we need to, you need to make sure to safeguard that at all costs because your health is your wealth. And especially in a young, a young mind, um, even if you are an adult and you've just been diagnosed, the, the feeling of, of losing something you had before is going to drive you to act out in ways that you acted before. So do not let short-sighted pleasure-seeking behavior uh, distract you from the long-term implications of unmanaged diabetes, right? We all have those internal conversations of, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to treat myself just this once. I'm going to, you know, kind of do what I know I'm not supposed to just this once. I'll treat myself just this one time. And then you start to get into the habit and the routine of doing these things regularly to the point that it is seriously negatively impacting your health. I think of drinking, you know, alcohol with this. I think of um, unhealthy eating habits, you know, takeout and meals you know you shouldn't be eating. So um, don't normalize self-sabotage in the name of doing what's normal, right? We talked about at the beginning of the podcast, you know, trying to be normal and fitting in or, you know, oh, well, everyone else is, so I, I guess I ought to. I mean, this can, you know, late, late work hours, not sleeping well. Uh, you may, you know, be experiencing a low or a high. You need to excuse yourself to handle those things. And you don't want to speak up because, uh don't want to be inconvenient, right? So you just go along with things um, at your own expense. Do not, do not encourage this. And when you see it, call yourself out and let people know what needs to be done and do it. So a lot of this has to do with where your attention is, right? And what you're giving your thoughts to. So diabetes can make you prone to always being worried about something. You're always kind of like guarding against something going wrong and it's exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting. Do not let this distract you from the possibility for good and positive things to come into your life. It makes a difference. Do not let diabetes rain on your daily parade. And then from an actual kind of a, practical aspect and, and navigating the food and supplement world, uh, the commercial side of diabetes, don't buy quick fixes. It's, it's not your, your, the cure for your diabetes is not one payment of 39.99 away. It just isn't. Okay. So it's so we, we just, it, wouldn't it be so nice if I could just give this wonderful salesman my money and then I just don't have to deal with this anymore. Maybe, maybe. In my experience, the journey that I've had in uncovering all the things about diabetes, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Okay, so um, I am a firm believer that you are never given something that you can't handle and that it wasn't given to you for a reason. 
with a purpose and that it's something that you can learn from, okay? So don't buy into things being marketed to you as the thing, the answer. Oh my God, you're doing all this stuff? You're missing this. Because guess what? I know this because I've been through it. I am, I'm still today, 20 years in, gullible, so gullible. I'm like, well, maybe, what if, what if this one is it? No, never is. It never is, right? So I've bought supplements, gemstones, ointments, therapy sessions, massages, books. Oh, so many, so many. And it's like, some of them were good. Some of them are still good. I still use some of them, but they are pieces in a much larger puzzle. Do not mistake steps in the right direction as your destination, right? This is a, a culmination of a lot of different things that, uh, that need to be covered. Don't get sold on the quick fix. Coming from someone who has fallen for the quick fix many times, all right? Um, so this, this, is the, this is it. This is kind of the, the key points of what not to do with a new diabetic diagnosis. Uh, like I mentioned, episode 38, the next episode will be dedicated to the do's opposite the don'ts that we covered in this episode about what you can do to positively impact your diabetes um, immediately post-diagnosis, okay? So think about, with everything you've learned here, uh, the ties between your mental outlook and its impact on your physical health, right? The company you keep, uh, the thoughts you have in your head and the resulting actions of those thoughts. What assumptions, when you start to feel yourself spiral or feel overwhelmed, um, what assumptions are you making about the disease and what's gonna happen if, you know, oh, if my blood sugar goes high, what's really gonna happen? Are you, you know, are you a bad person and your feet are going to get taken off or do you just need to give yourself more insulin to bring yourself back down? Okay. Um, and then how can you better prepare yourself to put yourself in a position to enjoy your life ex experiences without worry? Right. Let me tell you, there is a, there is a world where you can just jump in a pool without having to worry about where your pump is. Okay. There is a, uh, there is a world where you can go on a, a, a spur of the moment trip and you've got your supplies ready to go so that you don't have to worry about what, you know, how much insulin you have left or how many set changes or needles that you have. There are ways to put yourself in good positions. Okay. So I will see you in episode 38. I can't thank you enough for being here with me. Don't forget to subscribe. Join the Discord. Uh, this is the Discord is brand new. I'll have all of the links in the description. This is the kind of the long form um, chat room where we are talking about all the things that we're doing collectively, the diabetic community as a whole. We are pooling resources and experiences to bring out the best for everyone, whether you are newly diagnosed or you've had it a long time. Uh, subscribe here on YouTube. Follow me on TikTok. And like I said, I'll see you in episode 38, talking about what we need to do um, for diabetes. Again, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Here's to uh, not being diabetic anymore someday. <laughs>